Greetings and welcome back to room 303 and our talks with Walt as we are calling our readings through the deathbed edition of Walt Whitman's Leaves of Grass. We are in the section of Autumn Rivulets. We are in the second poem, Return of the Heroes. We've got eight sections in this little poem. It is a fascinating poem, great harvest poem as sometimes has been uh, referred to. We have commented already that l l Leaves of Grass is in some ways what we have called a sustained theodicy. Answer to the question, um, what do we do after the war? What do we do to grow beyond the war? And the answer here is that we're going to have a saner war. We're going to have sweeter wars. We're going to have life-giving wars. In other words, in passage number six, we'll see we're going to grow to something beyond the war with a new war that will be something uh, built from the old war, and that will be that will be the argument. Now, the assumptions here are that you've been following our stuff at LearnStrong.net down that left-hand side, Talks with Walt, our playlist, and everything from the for early inscriptions poems up to and including a set of introductory comments to Autumn Rivulets, and we've uh, we, and we've just finished with Consequent. Now, our Nortons will tell us about this poem that it was first published in the Galaxy, September 1867, under the title. A Carol of Harvest for 1867 and reprinted in Tinsley's magazine in London the following month. Then, with a number of revisions, it was published in the 1871 Passage to India. The same text appeared in the Passage to India Supplement of 1876 with an added headnote, quote, In all history, antique or modern, the grandest achievement yet for political humanity, grander even than the triumph of this union over secession, was the return, disbanding, and peaceful dis disintegration from compact military organization back into agricultural and civil employments of the vast armies, the two millions of embattled men of America, a problem reserved for democracy, our day and land to promptly solve, end quote. After some further revision, the poem appeared in Leaves of Grass 1881 with present title and text, which has dropped the original opening passage that ran like this, quote, a song of the grass and fields, a song of the soil and the good green grass, a song no more of the city streets, a song of the soil of fields, a song with the smell of sun-dried hay, where the nimble pinchers handle the pitchfork, a song tasting of new wheat and a fresh husk maize. We'll see much of this at the conclusion of this poem. Examination um, uh, of uh, suggests that Themes for two separate poems, The Abundant Harvest of 1867 and The Return of the Soldiers, had been skillfully united in a single poem, which sensitively associated the tilled lands of the Fakund land with the red fields of war. That is to say, from one harvest to another harvest. All right, we're going to turn now to the poem itself. I find this a fascinating poem right from the beginning with the word heroes. You'll remember in Song of Myself 18, the numberless unknown heroes equal to the greatest heroes known. We're, we're going to play this game. And, and in passage one, we'll go right to work. For the lands, and for these passionate days, and for myself, notice his, his trinity, now I a while retire to thee. We've heard this word retire. O soil of autumn fields, and there it is, autumn rivulets. Reclining on thy breast, in other words, now we're back to that word picture imagery of the early uh, parts of Song of Myself from um, obviously 1 as well as 3-5. Um, Reclining on thy breast, giving myself to thee. And of course, Song of Myself, passage 52, back to the earth where I came from. Answering the pulses of thy sane and equitable heart, tuning a verse for thee. And from verse it'll be song here in a second. And then we're going to get five O's. O oh, earth that has no voice, confide to me a voice. Again, we're back to the invocation of the muse game. O oh, harvest of my lands, I told you. The word harvest will come back again and again and again in this poem. O oh, boundless summer growths, again, all about evolution. O oh, lavish brown, petruant earth. Now, we're going to go from petruant, that is to say, uh, this, by the way, the only use in all these of grass, about to give birth, right? Petruant earth, we're going to go to fecund America here in passage three in a little bit. O oh, infinite teeming womb. Lots of birthing metaphors going on, obviously. A song to narrate thee. And then passage two will begin with ever upon this stage. And you'll uh, obviously remember that Shakespeare's As You Like It 2-7 will play this game of the world as a stage. Uh, and, and we see it again, of course, in Shakespeare's Macbeth 5-2, uh, uh, or 5-5 speech, the tomorrow speech. Ever upon this stage is acted God's calm annual drama. This notion of, of there being drama and then later it will be scenery. Gorgeous processions, songs of birds, sunrise, 
that fullest feeds and freshens most the soil. And notice the repetition of the word the now. Some 26 times it'll be the, 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 the. Watch this. The heaving sea, the waves upon the shore, the musical strong waves, the woods, the stalwart trees, the slender tapering trees. I can't help but think, of course, of Thoreau's Walden, as we've commented already on all of Walden at LearnStrong.net, but just his, his love of trees as being so representative. The, uh, the Lilliput, countless armies of the grass, I mean, it's the only use of Lilliput, and of course it takes us back to Swiss Gulliver's Travels of 1726. Uh, Whitman's audience obviously knew well what Lilliput here meant, and of course here we are with grass, um, and we're going to celebrate grass. Grass actually gets mentioned more in this poem than almost any other poem in all of Leaves of Grass. I think it's significant to that degree alone that we would pay attention to this poem. Obviously, Song of Myself, Passage 6 comes to mind. The heat, the showers, the measureless pastures, again, back to Song of Myself 46, I, it can't be measured. The scenery of the snows, the winds, uh, free orchestra, I can't help but think of Shelley's Ode to the West Wind in, in 1819 and 1820, right? Um, the stretching, light-hung roof of clouds, the clear cerulean, um, this from back to delicate cluster, we, we've seen this used a couple of times, just that beautiful blue, right? The silvery fringes, the high dilating stars, we're going to get dilation a couple of times, obviously it plays into that whole um, maternal uh, and birthing motif. The placid beckoning stars, the moving flocks and the herds, the plains, the emerald meadows, the shows of all the varied lands, obviously the varied carols I hear from so I hear America singing, and all the growths and products. And then in passage three, we're going to get some interesting religious language. Thou's going to get used 12 times, these, uh, thy is going to get used twice, and these going to get used three times. 17 times, in other words, we're going to get this kind of religious language. Fecund America, obviously, the whole notion of being ready to give birth. Today, thou art all over set in births and joys. We're going to get um, three uh, exclamation points. Thou groanest here, all this, all this birthing language. Thou groanest with riches. Thy wealth clothes thee as a swathing garment. Thou laughest loud with ache of great possessions. Again, all this, all this uh, birthing language of, of uh, groanest and ache. Of great possessions, a myriad twining life, and obviously with this twining, we go back to um, the lilacs last in the dooryard bloomed, especially passage 16. Life like interlacing vines binds all thy vast domain. This is the only use of this French word, although it does take us back to Keats's um, upon first looking into Chapman's Homer, as some huge ship freighted to water's edge, thou ridest into port. And notice here now the celebration of coming into port, much like, O Captain, my Captain. As rain falls from the heaven <clears throat> and vapors rise from earth, so have the precious values fallen upon thee and risen out of thee, thou envy of the globe, thou miracle. We're going to get the word miracle actually again, and we've seen it a number of times in Leaves of Grass. Thou miracle, thou bathed, choked, swimming in plenty, thou lucky mistress of the tranquil barns, thou prairie dame, notice prairie and dame capitalized, that sittest in the middle and lookest out upon thy world and lookest east and lookest west, dispensedress that by a word givest a thousand miles, I told you about his love of numbering, a million farms and missent nothing, that idea, nothing is missed, everything is included in America, thou all acceptress, thou hospitable, thou art, only art hospitable as God is hospitable. This idea of, uh, um, of being hospitable to everyone obviously makes us think of the Statue of Liberty. Of course, the 28th of October in 1886 is when that statue will be dedicated. Think about the power of this stanza then in, in providing that notion that America is the place where dynamic growth is happening everyone's invited to be a part of it. Obviously, we're going to come to this in its full fruition with Passage to India, as we've said in previous lectures. And then by Passage 4, we're going to start to sound a lot like lilacs last in the dooryard bloomed again with the very first word, when. When late I sang, sad was my voice. We, we understand why. Obviously, this is themed the Odyssey. Can we explain the value of the war? Here we go. Sad were the shows around me. Again, back to drama and shows with deafening noises of hatred and smoke of war. Obviously, this is all drum tap stuff. In the midst of the conflict, the heroes. I stood or passed with slow step through the wounded and dying. We have obviously seen this a number of times in drum taps as 
Obviously, Whitman was a nurse. But now I sing not war, nor the measured march of soldiers, nor the tents of camps, nor the regiments hastily coming up, deploying in line of battle. No more the sad, unnatural shows of war. Again, his use of the word shows takes us to the word drama. Asked room those flushed immortal ranks, the first fourth stepping armies, question mark. Ask room, alas, the ghastly ranks, the armies dread that followed. We're going to get to this word dread here in a few lines again. Okay. Um, you'll maybe remember this word dread from spirit uh, whose work is done, the dreaded hours. And then in parenthetics to finish section four, notice, pass, pass you proud brigades with your tramping sinewy legs, uh, taking us back to a number of poems. You're, you're going to hear all these echoes from drum tabs. With your shoulders young and strong and your knapsacks and your muskets, how elate I stood and watched you. You'll remember this from Rise O Days, um, from your fathomless deeps in, in, in drum tabs. How elate I stood and watched you where starting off you marched pass, then rattle drums again, for an army heaves in sight, oh, another gathering army, swarming, trailing on the rear, oh, you dread accruing army. Notice the repetition of oh, oh, here again. Oh, you regiment so piteous with your mortal diarrhea. Only use of that word is this one time. It didn't even get used in drum taps, and yet we're acutely aware of Really, that's how so many of the soldiers died, right, from dysentery and, di and diarrhea. With your fever, oh, my land's maimed darlings, with the plenteous bloody bandage and the crutch, lo, your pallid army follows. We're going to see this word pallid in the sleeper's passage two. When we get there, we'll point it out. And then to passage five, but, in other words, that was then, this is now. But on these days of brightness, on the far-stretching, beauteous landscape, he, he learned to use this word from Milton, who of course borrowed it from the Dutch, as we've commented in our lectures on Milton's Paradise Lost at LearnStrong.net. The roads and lanes, the high-piled farm wagons and the fruits and barns. In other words, what's the harvest? What's the back end of all this terrible war and warmongering that happened during the Civil War? Well, there it is. It's all about harvest. It's the new America, the growing America, and now we're going to hear a lot, a, a lot about that. He says... But on these days of brightness, should the dead intrude? Again, this is the theodicy question. Ah, the dead to me mar not, they fit well in nature. Here's his theodicy, right? That the dead were necessary for the dynamic harvest that will be America. They fit very well in the landscape under the grass and trees. Obviously, Song of Myself, Passage 6 comes to mind, and along the edge of the sky, in the horizon's far margin. Nor do I forget you departed, notice capitalized, nor in winter or summer my... Lost ones, again, I think so much of Leaves of Grass is about remembering, as we've commented so many times. It's about remembering. It's about reminding us that the new is the new. The NEW is the KNEW, and we've all, we've been through this. We have tendencies as generations to imagine that what we're experiencing is somehow brand new, somehow not to be experienced in the same way, and of course it's, it's craziness because it's all, been, it's all been done before. And so he says, I don't forget. I do not forget you departed, nor in the winter or summer my lost ones, but most in the open air, open air, as a phrase, gets used 14 times in Leaves of Grass. Of course, probably the most famous is Song of, My, uh, Song of the Open Road, Passage 6, right? The, the secret to making the greatest persons and the greatest poems is, of course, to grow up and to live in the open air. But most in the open air is now, when my soul is wrapped and in peace like pleasing phantoms, goes back, taking us back to um, by, uh, Blue Ontario Shore, right? Passage 1. The, the phantom that will be referenced there. Your memories rising glide silently by me. That is to say, it's in moments of the greatest harvest that Whitman says we all should remember the greatest sacrifice. If there is an argument that you guys as high school students and college students are not as patriotic as you should be, it is not your fault, as I've said many times in other lectures. It is, in fact, my generation's fault. Why? Because we haven't given you the proper reasons to be patriotic. Reading passages like this will remind us the only reason that we get to enjoy all of this stuff, in a word, freedom, is because of the sacrifices of so many who came before. And Whitman says, I'm not going to forget that. Passage 6, well, this is interesting. Norton's will tell us that we're about to be reminded of the famous, of the famous uh, meeting with Washington. Uh, Whitman here in passage 6 will give an eyewitness account of the soldiers return to Washington 
in two of his Specimen Days entries, the Army's returning of May 7th, 1865, and the Grand Review of May the 23rd. He says it this way, I saw the day, by, by the way, I saw five times, notice it. I saw the day, the return of the heroes, and now obviously the title of the poem. Notice in parenthetics, yet the heroes never surpassed, shall never return them that day, I saw not. In other words, as Lincoln says in his Gettysburg Address, so much influencing, I think, what's being said here as well, that the, the true heroes are obviously the, the fallen, right, the fallen. I saw the interminable corps, I saw the processions of armies, I saw them approaching, defiling by with divisions. It's fascinating that he uses the word defiling and divisions. That word choice, which seems to suggest something other than harmony, and yet obviously he's emphasizing harmony. Streaming, obviously rivulets, right, autumn rivulets, streaming northward, their work done. Um, we're going to hear this, their work done, used one other time in autumn rivulets when we get to Outlines for a Tomb in Passage 2. Camping a while in clusters of mighty camps, no holiday soldiers, youthful yet veterans, worn, swart, handsome, strong, of the stock of homestead and workshop, hardened of many a long campaign and sweaty march, inured on many a hard-fought battle or a bloody field. Um, all of this we've seen uh, and been emphasized already, of course, especially in drum taps. He's coming back to it. And then a pause, and notice the use of the dash, and I think Emily Dickinson will play this game brilliantly as well, the use of the dash to give a pause right after the word pause. A pause, the armies wait. Notice we get this waiting that will happen. A million flushed in battle conquers, wait, the world too waits. Again, taking us back to Jefferson and the Declaration of Independence, let facts be submitted to a candid or watching world. And again, I think very influenced, uh, very, very much influenced the thinking of Whitman here. Notice, the world too waits. Then, soft as breaking night and sure as dawn, they melt, they disappear. Exult, O lands. Uh, you'll remember this word, exult, from Song of Joys, clap hands, exult. Exult, O lands, victorious lands, not there your victory on those red, shuddering fields, but here and hence your victory. That is to say, the new battlefield. The new battlefield will become the farm field. In other words, the technologies of weaponry of war will become new technologies of a different kind of war, right? Melt. Melt away, ye armies. Notice again some of the religious language, ye armies. Disperse, ye blue-clad soldiers. Resolve, ye back again. Give up for good your deadly arms. Over the arms, the fields henceforth for you, or south or north, with saner wars, sweet wars, life-giving wars. So in other words, we go from arms to arms. And I think, I, I've said this to you guys, I think Whitman is having a great bit of fun as he is playing the, the game in Leaves of Grass of wordplay. Notice, from arms to arms. That is to say, from the arms of war to now, the arms that will in, in, in engage in, in planting and in gardening and in growing things, right? Passage 7, and of course 8, then to finish this, he'll begin with the word loud. Loud, O oh my throat, and clear, O oh, soul. Notice the exclamation marks that will begin to kind of just uh, uh, um, uh, pile on as we end this poem. The season of thanks, obviously autumn comes to mind, autumn rivulets. The season of thanks and the voice of full yielding, obviously harvest. The chant of joy and power with boundless fertility, again this idea of birthing. All tilled and untilled fields expand before me. I see the true arenas of my race, or first, or last, man's innocent and strong arenas. It's fascinating that he uses the word innocent, of course, because early in the poem he's talking about giving birth to an infant that would obviously be innocent. And then he says it again with heroes. I see the heroes at other toils. I see well wielded in their hands the better weapons. So. Again, Whitman and his dance with his understanding of technology, it's fascinating the way it gets played out. And here it is, right? That is to say, we're going from the weapons and technologies of terrible bloody war to new technologies, to a different kind, to grow things, if you will. I see, and then we're going to get this mother of all three times, I see where the mother of all, with full spanning eye, gazes forth, dwells long, and counts the varied gathering of the products. Again, harvest, right? Busy the far, the sunlit 
Panorama, again, back to drama. Prairie, orchard, yellow grain of the north, again, always coming back to grass as that penultimate symbol. Cotton and rice of the south and Louisiana cane. Open, unseeded fallows, rich fields of clover and timothy, obviously, again, back to grass. Kine and horses feeding, the droves of sheep and swine. And, notice three in a row now, and many a stately river, again, back to rivulets, flowing, and many a jocund brook, we'll think of Grace, uh, uh, um, elegy written from, from, uh, at a, uh, uh, from a country churchyard, right? We've given full lectures on it at LearnStrong.net with the use of the word jocund. Jocund brook, and healthy uplands, with herby perfumed breezes, and the good green grass, that delicate miracle, the ever reoccurring grass. I love that delicate use gets used 25 times in Leaves of Grass. And I love that Jockin gets used in Warble for Lilac Time. I love how he keeps coming back to the symbol of grass in this poem. To finish now in passage 8, he speaks directly, he speaks directly to you, to a hero. You are a hero, that is to say, toil on heroes. Notice all the exclamation points. Harvest the products. And there it is. That's his theodicy. In other words, you are a recipient of the, the Great War, that is to say the Civil War. You are a recipient of all of the planting and growing that proceeded and to come, right? And, and so he's going to make this, toil on heroes, harvest the products. Not alone on these, on those warlike fields, the mother of all with dilated form and lambent eyes watched you. Toil on heroes, toil well. Handle the weapons well. I think it's a fascinating line. In other words, accept the gift that's been given to you as Americans and use it well. Be worthy of it, I think, is the argument that Whitman's making. The mother of all, yet here as ever, she watches you. I love that idea. 